Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Unpacking the Word, the podcast where we dive deeper into what it means to live in an ethnocidal society and how we can combat that by creating sustainable culture. I'm Luna, and I'm joined by my co-host, Barrett. Hey, how's it going? Um, So today's episode, we're going to talk about the incidents of gun violence that have happened this past week where like mistaken identity or not even mistaken identity just like being on someone's yard or knocking on someone's doorbell or you know mistakenly trying to get into the wrong car has resulted in uh, like fatal and you know really you know horrible shootings and we're trying to we're going to articulate how America's ethnocidal society explains why these things are happening and they're more they're not like an anomaly they're it's something that makes sense within this society which is pretty tragic to acknowledge but that's the reality of it um so i'll 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 jump in real quick to kind of explain why this scenario exists if you look at you know the, the first example was uh that we were all aware of was uh, Ralph Yarrell, you know, a 16-year-old African-American young man who was going, who went to the wrong house to pick up his, uh, his twin brothers. And when he rang the doorbell, an 84-year-old white man opened the door and shot him in the head. And Ralph survived. He ended up running. He also, after he fell on the ground, after being shot from the head, the, the, the old man shot him in the arm. And Ralph ran for safety. And eventually he was... After going about three houses, you know, they called 911. He was taken to the hospital, and thankfully he survived. And so when this verse happened, a lot of the conversations were about, uh, like, racial issues in the U.S., and that's perfectly warranted. It makes sense. But then a couple of days later, there was a story about uh, Kaylin Gillis, who was a 20-year-old white woman who, who drove down the wrong driveway, and as she was pulling out, uh, the homeowner shot at the car and killed her. And so there's a clear example how, like, sure, race is a factor, but that's not the only factor in these shootings. There's something bigger at play here that we need to be aware of, and ethnocide speaks to this. So this is how it works. So with ethnocide, you the goal is to destroy African culture while keeping African people, and that's happened during the transatlantic slave trade. They wanted to keep Africans so that colonizers could create a chattel slavery system in the Americas. And so if you're going to have a system of sustained division where one group is being oppressed forever in perpetuity, that's the structure, that's, that was the goal, you want to make classifications to distinguish between the oppressor and the oppressed because the oppressor doesn't want to casually get mistaken for the oppress for the oppressed and then become oppressed in perpetuity. Makes sense? And so with these European colonizers, they had these constructed racial classifications of white and black. Makes sense? That's what they did. Now the thing is, the classification of white that they created the identity that they attached to that complexion. It was based on the one drop rule. So one drop of African blood or whatever would completely erase their whiteness forever. And so they created a culture where to survive as a white person, anything non-European posed a threat to you. Anything that you didn't see as yourself posed a threat to your identity and this is an identity that you cared about you know more than existence you could say and so if you have this culture where people have been brought up where anything that's not themselves could erase their identity they're going to be inclined to view anything and everything as a threat especially if they think that that thing is something that's not themselves so Race makes it really a, cl- a key distinction. You know, that makes it easy for that person to be another. But any person that's perceived as a stranger, oh, that person could, if I get a drop of that, 
that's my identity gone. What I think of myself is gone. I'm now going to feel that using lethal force to sustain this identity is warranted. And America has been doing that from the beginning. And we still do it to this day. And we're seeing it play out. And it's absolutely absurd because, you know, if everything around you could be a threat, well, that's just a horrible way to live. And if you feel lethal force is a way that you can justify uh, combating these imagined threats, well, now you're going to justify killing and attacking anything and everything at any given moment. And that's what we're seeing right now. And so that's, you know, the, the racial dynamics uh, can make this more uh, apparent, but it's not mm -hmm. racially exclusive. It's a cultural thing where anybody, regardless of your race, if you are in America and you attach yourself to this, to the notions of identity and, and what threats are, you could be a African American, you could be a Latino, you could be an Asian person, and view anything that you consider to be an other as a thing that could destroy your identity. And now, using lethal force as a justification, you know, the, it's more likely that a white American will have that perspective, but it's not like exclusively a racial thing. Yeah, I was also going to say too, just I feel like a conversation that has been lacking a little bit is also just a gender analysis, right? I mean, Caitlin Gillis is a 20-year-old white woman, I think you said, and there's definitely um, like a racialized aspect of systemic violence and also gendered violence as well. And um, like, I mean, something that I've been questioning, so like a lot of things came up as you were talking for me, Barrett, and you know, one of the things that we can talk about is definitely angst and the angst that a lot of white men have in today's society um, with, I don't know, just the growing number of like progressive politics or the growing number of people, you know, calling out or calling in folks to be more inclusive, to kind of vote out exclusionary politics and things like that. Um so yeah, one thing is angst that came up for me, and that's kind of a word that's been resonating with me, and I've been thinking about a lot these past couple of weeks as we've seen like a great number of just you know gun gun mass shootings, gun violence take the people take people's lives or severely fatal like near fatally harm people, right? And then another thing that I've been thinking about is like this has been going on for a long time, like you've mentioned, <laughs> and that we've talked about in past episodes, like this is kind of the fabric, the thread that has like sewn America's culture, right? It's like our experience with guns was never to protect, it was truly, well, it was to protect angst <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in so many ways. Right. And it was to protect um, a certain existence of people or an essence of people, rather, not an existence mm -hmm. um, and to continue to suppress people. Right. So something that I've been wondering about is have we has it always been underreported until something violently happens to a community? Or is it now that we're more comfortable talking with it? And in some ways, like this comfort level that we have in talking about it is also normalizing this kind of culture. Like we're becoming numb to it almost, I feel like, you know. So, so those are some really, those two really good questions. So what I'd say, let's start with the angst, all right? Because this will go into the second question. So for most of a, American existence, and this is like pre-United States, it's just colonization. The narrative that colonizers projected is that like there was nothing here, you know, like there is nothing here and they're going to come here and it's going to be a new Europe. That was, that was the goal. Like the cities are new, this, new, that it's just Europe is here. And the goal is to live as Europeans in a place that's not Europe. That, that that was the goal. And so when you do that, if you're not in Europe, 
and the goal is to live as Europeans, not in Europe forever, everything in this continent will pose a threat to being able to remain European. Just everything, just like the presence of indigenous people, the presence, you know, the, the, the presence of African Americans that they, you know, of African people that they brought over here. But just, you know, food and all sorts of stuff will be a threat because if you get a drop of that, you'll be considered less European and then all of it will go away. You won't be European anymore. And so I think the the narrative that America has has articulated is really one of like privatization where they're going to have like their private European enclave with uh, like a wall or something, some sort of barrier from indigeneity and the land here. And the, we'll live in this continent as a European idea without an attachment to place. So when we talk about America and the, like, the lack of anxiety, that lack of anxiety happens when those barriers are erected and they feel like they can like calmly exist as European people outside of Europe. Now, when the anxiety shows up, it's just because existence is getting in the way of their idea. You know, the fact that this continent had a vibrant civilization and it wasn't nothing, that creates anxiety. The fact that indigenous people want to be able to live as people and have their ideas and their culture, that creates anxiety. The fact that African Americans want to live here, not as subjugated people, but as people, and kind of encroach upon this European exclusive idea, that creates anxiety. And so the anxiety that these white people feel is inevitable. It's the it's an anxiety that shows up via other non-European things wanting to be able to exist in a place that's not Europe. Now, when we cultivate an, our, the, the narrative that America has articulated and cultivated for years about what America is, it's a white-dominated narrative where it's essentially like living in white enclaves with white perspectives and, and people doing anything they can to try to be able to live within that white enclave as if they're a white person even though they like can't be so like you'll you know if you immigrate here maybe you change your name and you anglicize this and anglicize that and you do all this stuff to try to live within that white space like that's the narrative of america without the anxiety is that they put the borders up and you can live as a european outside of europe forever and everything that isn't european will kind of try to mold itself into becoming European. That makes it so that they don't feel anxiety. The anxiety happens when those people try to live as people that aren't European and don't live in Europe. That makes them freak out. That makes them feel like stuff's getting taken away. Their way of life is being disrupted, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, this, let's, let's you know, I can't speak for, that the 84 year old man, like I don't know his perspective precisely, but you know, he lived, his wife had recently been t- taken to like a, a, like a, a home and he was living by himself. I believe the, the reports, he watched a lot of Fox News. So he probably viewed his house, his land as like the refuge of his whiteness where he could live in there without any sort of anxiety, so long as nobody like yeah. encroached upon that space. That was like his white sanctuary. A black person showing up and engaging in any way was like a, an invasion that would destroy his essence. And if you live in a place that values the idea of whiteness more than the existence of the people here and the place as a whole, you're gonna view that idea as more important than life itself. And so then you'll want to, you know, you'll use lethal force to sustain that idea. And so that's where the the anxiety comes from. And clearly it's gonna impact white men the most because these are all their ideas, you know? (laughs) Exactly. So they're they're gonna feel the brunt of it because it's it's their idea. Um, And so that's the anxiety component. Um, I believe your, your second question, what was the second question again? 
The second question I feel like was like, was it underreported in the past? And like, are we now just kind of comfortable talking about it? And in some ways, is that comfort kind of normalizing and making us numb to this kind of ethnocidal violence? So it it definitely was underreported, but you have to think about before all the reporting was within like that white enclave. Mm -hmm. So if you live in this white enclave, that's the society, the people that aren't white that are trying to come into it, the narrative of those people is going to be as like their threats or they don't know what they're doing or whatever. So like the the narrative will, will be dehumanizing. And you can just look at the history of the United States. That's how it's always been. You know, if, if African-Americans did something that wasn't just like molding themselves to live alongside white people in the way that white people imagined, then there is something mentally wrong with black people. You know, uh, Asians, you know, everybody, all immigrants. That was the narrative. And so the narrative of what was reported and what was good and what was bad came from these white enclaves. Well, now, I'd say following the, you know, the civil rights movement in the 60s, which also resulted in like a, a change in our immigration policies, the country's just more diverse. There's more people living in multicultural enclaves. And those enclaves may be, may still have like a, a Western European ideology, but they're saying like, we can all live equally within this Western European way of thinking uh, and it not be like a, a racialized white one. It's like an ideologically European one. And so when they have that, therefore, when you live in something that's ideologically European, but not racialized European, if someone from that ideological space accidentally goes into somebody else's imagined space that's like a racialized European perspective or, you know, something like that, then we're going to report it because we now see more of those people as human beings. More people are going to be inclined to reporting it. So like theoretically, and it, it's hard to find these statistics, but, you know, like America theoretically could be safer now than it used to be. It's just that we now are more aware of the things that are happening to Americans, especially Americans of color, because we care. But, you know, like during Jim Crow in the early 1900s, there is, you know, something, if a, if a black person knocked on a white person's door and the white person killed them, like that's not making the news. Like, that's not, you know, like the only thing that might have made the news would be a story of how the black person attacked a white person and it's just completely fabricated, you know? So, right. so like, that's, that's the difference. It's not, it's, uh, it's, it's that there's a greater capacity for Americans to care about the lives of non-white people now. And so the reoccurring terror, we are more aware of it because we view it as terrorism and not just the natural order of things. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, going back to the angst, right? I I like how you put it because, you know, these are ideas created by white Anglo-Saxon men. <laughs> the idea that they're like, their whiteness, their masculinity, their identity as men, like needs to be protected. Like, I don't know if there's a way to formulate this besides just the fact that it's just horrible. <laughs> yeah. But it's quite it, heinous. Yeah. It's like, objectively speaking, they're just outrageously bad ideas that, that have not yeah. been beneficial at all. Uh, and so it's, it's kind of like, say, so, you know, you and I both teach. If there is a person who has been a D student their entire life, and they haven't, nothing detrimentals happen to them because they're a D student. They're going to formulate some philosophy, some theory about how being a D student is incredible. 
And that's the best thing. Yeah. And, that you, and that not knowing stuff is what is, is better than knowing things. They're going to have that whole thing going. And their whole identity is about how this bad idea is a great idea. To the point where they clearly they won't consider it to be a bad idea. They'll think this is wonderful. But they're like D students. When that moment shows up, happens, and someone explains to them how this idea is horrible. It's not an A idea. It's a D, maybe even an F idea, if we're being like honest. That's going to be devastating to everything that that person knows about themselves and the world and all of that stuff. That's what's happening. And that's, that's the dynamic. These people have, you know, for a long time, have cultivated a way of life that's just based on their delusions being more important than life itself. And then when someone says, actually, being alive is more important than your delusions, they, they lose their mind. <laughs> yeah, it appends mm -hmm. their whole idea of thinking. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's like another good analogy. I'm, this past week, like my students, I have talked about like creating the perfect criminal, basically. And like why it's been so hard to, in the past, like to settle with the idea that like a lot of white men have just gone away with their criminal activity. My students, I talked about like how there's this idea of a perfect criminal for a specific crime, right? And they kind of like went through their own biases of like, if we said this person was charged with like crime for like dealing with cocaine, you know, they kind of constructed their own biases on paper, right? And it came to life. Um, white collar crime, like a lot of the times they had listed white men, you know, <laughs> white mm -hmm. rich men, actually. And then we also talked about like creating the perfect victim. And a lot of the times, like what they had constructed was like a, like a well-meaning, innocent white woman. And yeah. I mean, it, it kind of goes in line with, with what you were saying with constructing like these D students, F students, A students, we all have different biases and assumptions for like the ways in which these students carry out their lives. But really, I mean, there's also like the assessment of who's grading them. And with these criminals too, you know, there's also an assessment that we don't see of like, who's judging them? Like, who's the jury? What is the, what's the court look like? Yeah. So like teaching, I think is a, is a good analogy for a lot of this stuff because teaching only has a validity if there's an understood idea of what good is, you know? Like if good is not clear then how could you say what is an a or a b or a c or whatever like what th there has to be a clarity about what good is and isn't yeah and when you think about and i think about this a lot but when you think about western civilization and especially colonization there's not really a clarity about what good means there they have a lot of like ethical questions where like you explore the actions that somebody already did and then you discuss if those actions were good or bad but like that's that's like after the fact you know like when that person did those did those actions that you're now deciding are bad i'm sure they had a logic at the time that made them believe right. it was good so like looking at good or bad after the fact is irrelevant it's like what you need to have is a, a idea of what good or bad is in the present so that you can consistently do it and not just like reassess your actions after you did it and then confirm whether they are good or bad you know like it's kind of it's, it's weird and so right. when we're talking about this idea of essence which it's like existential term we use it a lot in at scl and you know essence is essentially like your ideas um and there's this you know quote by uh, rene descartes that uh i think therefore i am and that quote says that like your thoughts, your capacity to think or your thoughts confirm your existence. So that's saying that like your ideas precede your existence. Without your ideas, then how can you prove that you exist? Well, mm -hmm. when you have that, that means that your ideas don't have to have a connection to reality 
because existence is a secondary thing. And I think this influences a lot of how Westerners perceive what's good and what's bad, where good can be a thing that doesn't have to be connected to reality. Like, it just, it's before reality, like it precedes existence. And so that's why you'll have structures where like a certain group of people, based on how they look, or how much money they make or something, are just good. And that goodness has nothing to do with their actions. Their actions, we're now going to conclude those actions must be good because we've already decided that they're good before they did anything. And this is clearly an approach that has that white people have applied to themselves in colonization, where like their actions as colonizers are like, well, I thought of it. I thought it made sense. I th- I've concluded that I'm good. Therefore, these are good actions. And the goal is to look and find the good in what I do because I'm good. People who aren't white people, the narrative has more so been like, those people are bad. We need to perceive and look for the bad in them because that's what they are. And so now we start imagining like what a perfect person is, like a perfect good person, a perfect bad person. Like perfection isn't like a thing that's even real. It's just an idea that they think makes sense and now we need to create constructs or concepts that validate, uh, validate this idea. And it's like, it's not real. There is no perfect anything. It, there's yeah. just existing. And so, you know, you know, white people will have an idea that, you know, they're good and there's like a perfect white ideal that they are, are aspiring towards or whatever. It's just total nonsense. And at the end of the day, I think it makes it really hard for people to have a clear idea of what like a lived experiential good is and so like even now we're basically as a society trying to have a conversation about how our relationship with guns is creating a lived experiential bad it's bad and we need to not do it anymore and there is doesn't seem to be a universal agreement that people feeling they could die at any moment for some arbitrary thing is a is is bad enough that we need to do anything to prevent it like talk about a a society that clearly values essence more than existence and doesn't have a clarity about what good or bad even means right you know like it's a it's a it's yeah it's a whole another level of problematic (laughs) <laughs> yeah and i mean you've talked about that a lot too in past episodes just like how our idea of american freedom was never about like true liberation or about living and surviving fairly and equally it's always been about maintaining the status quo of like a, a white essence right and like keeping that white essence intact anything that strays beyond that violates, pokes, prods, challenges it is a threat to American freedom. And, uh, but I, I mean, I, I hope (laughs) that we're closer to, you know, addressing this epidemic of gun violence. I hope so too. I'd say one thing that is is a key when you think about like white essence is like the essence is the idea that they've attached to people with that skin complexion. You know what I mean? So it's not like something that's inherent to people with that skin complexion. <laughs> yes. It's, yeah. it's, it's the idea that they associate with their skin color and then they use to define themselves. And so I, I think one of the signs of progress culturally is that there are people in America that look European, that don't care that much about this idea of a white essence. Like they're perfectly okay with the the next generation. Like if they have a child, to that child be of a, a slightly different complexion, like they're mixed or whatever. And the their ideas of how to live in the world can be continued to someone even if that person doesn't look white. Like that's like a pretty profound amount of progress for this society, which is not much, but it's quite significant where you could have 
white people that care about existence more than their essence. And once we can do more of that, then we'll clearly care more about stopping gun violence and things like that because we'll care about existence more than, you know, our delusions. And that's yeah. clearly happening. You see, looks like there's plenty of outraged white people in, uh, in Ralph's neighborhood. And there's outraged white people in New York after, you know, Kaylin Gillis was shot and, and murdered. You know, they're caring more and more about existence. And there's that moment where you go, you know what? My existence is more important than this idea that uh, has been thrust upon me. And that's that's how you make progress. So hopefully we, you know, we can do that sooner rather than later. But that's really what it boils down to. So that's how ethnocide explains it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, everyone... I think that pretty much concludes this week's episode. Thanks for tuning in. We hope that everyone is following us on our socials at SCL underscore community. Folks can also subscribe to our Substack um, on our website. And uh, we thank you all for listening and tuning in today. Yeah. Thanks for listening. And I will say like these topics are... You know, not the most uplifting, but the, the uplifting no. component is that there is a way to rectify the problem, which is, you know, as simple as caring about existence more than delusions. Once you can do that, then incredible things can happen. And so hopefully we, more and more people are inclined to do that. So, but thanks for listening and uh, we'll see you next week. <laughs>